everything's different now. This is not how Zelda games have worked in the past. This is not how Mario games work even now. Some people have recently said that Tears of the Kingdom makes Breath of the Wild look like a tech demo, and while I wouldn't go that far, I think there is strong reason to think that Fujibashi-san has quite different and a more strategic approach to game development that is both revolutionary and evolutionary. But what is he building, and why, and where might it lead? If you haven't seen my previous video in this series, linked on the video, we met Hidamaru Fujibashi and learnt how, after directing his first Zelda in his mid-twenties, he has gone on to become the absolute MVP of the Zelda team. Incrementally, over three handheld games, one multiplayer spin-off, one traditional Zelda, and two open-air Zeldas, he has been bringing more and more of his flavour to the series, and some of those philosophies, in particular the notion he's championed of multiplicative gameplay, now feel hardwired into the structure of the franchise going forward. But let's take a step back and see what the pre-Fujibashi approach was. Taking a look at those 3D Zeldas, and for that matter Nintendo's other flagship series, the Super Mario games, what you'll probably recall is a particularly interesting or unusual mechanic that was introduced and used in those games. So Super Mario Sunshine had Flood, Super Mario Galaxy had the anti-gravity mechanics, Super Mario Odyssey had Cappy. Same has been true of Zelda, the masks in Majora's Mask, the island exploration of the Great Sea, the Wolf Link sequences in Twilight Princess. These were great, memorable mechanics that each made the game distinctive. So here's my question. Where were the flood mechanics in Super Mario Galaxy? Where were the anti-gravity mechanics in 3D World or the Catsuit in Odyssey? Where were the masks in Wind Waker or the King of Red Lions in Twilight Princess or Wolf Link in Skyward Sword? If the question had never even occurred to you, it's because Nintendo focuses heavily on creating new, strong mechanics and only later builds its gameplay around them. New games require new mechanics, and so the pressure is on them to constantly innovate. The density of new ideas is what makes Nintendo games so special. Of course, these mechanics were grafted onto some kind of underlying structure. For Mario, there are two basic styles. The sandbox style, pioneered by Super Mario 64, and then developed in Sunshine and Odyssey. Then there's also the core space structure of 3D World and the Galaxy games. For Zelda, the core blueprint of the Zelda games was truly set by Ocarina of Time, which itself in many ways was a 3D realisation of the formula of A Link to the Past. Sequential, themed dungeons with dungeon-specific items across a gradually unfolding overworld leading to a final encounter. Generally, the same items would return, or similar ones would return, and sometimes elements grew in stature. The Ocarina from Link's Awakening became a core part of Ocarina of Time, and music continued to be an important part of the series, notably in Wind Waker. Similarly, the introduction of motion controls in Twilight Princess presaged a much more focused attempt to make controls central to the game in Skyward Sword. Also on the Mario side, note the Gushams and the Moon sections of Odyssey these do flirt with reviving mechanics from Sunshine and Galaxy, and similarly in Breath of the Wild we see the return of masks. Nonetheless, the basic similarity of some key elements make it even more important that the new elements took the series in a new direction. Creating something brand new each game is good in that it allows the developers to be creative and unpredictable, and also allows them to course correct where they go wrong. I love the Wind Waker designs, but it's clear from the reaction and their subsequent more realistic approach in the Twilight Princess game that they felt they needed to overcorrect. It was Skyward Sword before they realised that some kind of balance of an artistic and impressionistic form with a broadly realistic set of proportions would work best for the series, and Breath of the Wild was the first time that the art style that was sent into a tailspin by the crazy change of Wind Waker really came to a settling place. I'm not saying that all future Zelda's will look like Breath of the Wild, but that look fusing broad realism with some of the softness and artistic flair of cell shaded graphics definitely is a good look for the series and less likely to turn players off as the more extreme graphical polarities of Wind Waker or for that matter, Twilight Princess. I think you can see a similar course correction at other points. Sunshine really pushed Mario in a different direction, away from his traditional mechanics. Galaxy seemed different and exciting, but if you take the progression of Super Mario Land and Super Mario World to the next step, it's really a logical extrapolation of the course based series of the 90s. He's had a land, he's had a world, and now he's got his own galaxy. Then you had 3D World being superseded by the most open Mario ever, perhaps, in Odyssey. And look, this is just a natural process of the evolution of games. Lots of ideas being whittled down. 
Odyssey and 3D World director Kenta Montakura has talked about the Nintendo staff having a message board where they just pool ideas and a task being to filter down the number of new ideas and see which ones can make the game. But I do think there's evidence that Hidamaru Fujibayashi has taken a different approach to things with Zelda. Think about how many core aspects of Fujibayashi's prior two Zelda games, Skyward Sword and Breath of the Wild, were kept and how many were discarded in Tears of the Kingdom. Now, granted, Tears was a sequel to Breath of the Wilds, so it's hardly surprising that the games share a pattern, but I think you can find that basically everything in both games that was of interest to Fujibayashi has been kept and developed and evolved. When people talk about Breath of the Wild being a tech demo, what they mean is they haven't built something separate from the first game, but they built on it and evolved it. And look, Skyward Sword was clearly a flawed game in many ways, but I think if any game was a tech demo for Tears of the Kingdom, surely it's Skyward Sword. The verticality is all there, from the Sky Islands to the whispers of a dark kingdom beneath the ground. Even the number and size and distribution of the islands is broadly similar, with one central hub island and multiple other places in the clouds serving as puzzle locations or treasure hiding spots. Then look at the additions of Skyward Sword that now feel utterly essential to the series. The sailcloth. Even the first few hours of Tears of the Kingdom where I potted around before realising that I would probably get the paraglide if I just followed the main quest, those felt torturous after the freedom to glide that Breath of the Wild had offered. And that change was fun in its own way, but I felt the game hadn't truly begun until I got my ultra hand on the paraglider. There's more. A major addition in Skyward Sword that's not commonly remarked upon is the stamina meter, which in many ways is crucial to the experience of Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. And it's notable that this is another game to experiment with mechanics to do with time. Skyward Sword's best moments for me all relate to the absolutely amazing mechanic of the time shift stones, which change the immediate surroundings to a different time. I love time travel narratives, and this still feels such a fresh and imaginative take on the idea. This isn't quite the same as Stasis or Recall, which experiment with time in different ways, but the core concept isn't too dissimilar. Individual items are subject to time restrictions. Look, there are the seeds of so many terrific ideas in Skyward Sword. Obviously, that title is a very long way from where we have reached with Tears of the Kingdom, though. The Loftwing is a gameplay mechanic influenced partly by Epona and partly by the King of Red Lions, the idea of a charismatic steed for the main character whereas Tears of the Kingdom opens up traversal to an almost endless array of possible choices through the use of vehicles. And the central control mechanic of motion sword fighting, which seemed to be more a product of the interests of the hardware development team possibly than necessarily something Fujibashi-san has ever expressed too much personal interest in, did not quite work as expected, although the idea is fundamentally good and I do think it has potential someday when the technology catches up to return to the Zelda series. Nevertheless, Skyward Sword has really become a blueprint game for what became Breath of the Wild in a way the previous games simply weren't. Can you imagine the future without the paraglider? Does that game sound fun to you after what we've experienced with the last three games? What about without the stamina wheel? You could think of another approach to stamina, but to what end? After Tears of the Kingdom, would you really want to return to a version of the game without at least some degree of verticality? I'm not saying the Sky Islands will be as essential to the experience they were in Skyward Sword or Tears of the Kingdom, but... Like the Rito, Goron, Gerudo and Zora always seem to make their way back in different forms, I feel that most, if not all, future Zelda games will include a substantial skybound portion and verticality as part of their gameplay. It really seems to me that Fujibayashi isn't going down the route of turning over the table and starting again with fresh ideas after each game, but rather has strong ideas of which mechanics are fun and is relentlessly building them up and building them out. As much of Breath of the Wild was a response to Skyward Sword and a change to conventions, it staggers me how much Fujibashi has salvaged. But he's done the same thing in Breath of the Wild. We all know the story of how Skyward Sword released and then along came Breath of the Wild and upended those conventions completely. But what do you get when you upend the conventions of something? Well, you get new conventions. Parallels between the structure of Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wild quickly become obvious and remain so as the game progresses. Starting on a relatively safe tutorial area, completing four shrines to get four key powers, before exploring a world full of Koroks, memories, shrines, overworld bosses and regional threats which will require a different ally to beat. My hunch is that all these aren't just repetition for the sake of it being a sequel. If anything, by reusing that same world, the natural thing would be to change the gameplay rhythms that much more. No, I think these are solid mechanics that the team want to incorporate and use as part of their core structure, their core engine for what makes a Zelda game, if you will. 
The Koroks are fun, disposable puzzles that ensure every corner of the world feels alive and worth exploring. The memories give an emotional resonance to the landscape in a way that's tricky to do when you don't have a linear narrative to fall back on. The champions or sages allow the game to seem less insular and to introduce different gameplay techniques. The new format of the dungeons probably bears greater exploration another time, and the Great Plateau and the Great Sky Islands serve obvious tutorial purposes. But yet again, it seems to me that nothing is wasted. Look at the core powers in each game. Instead of being gifted dungeon-specific items only when needed, the major innovation of Breath of the Wild was that you'll be given four specific powers at the start of the game that will be utilised in some way throughout the rest of the quest. The same is true of Tears of the Kingdom, and what's intriguing to me is that each of the four has quite a distinctive role in terms of gameplay. Magnesis and Ultra Hand are about manipulating your environment. Link has always been able to move pots and vases, but while this feels powerful in a 2D environment where a pot might be as big as a main character, it feels underpowered in a vast 3D landscape. And look, Magnesis is still effectively in the game from Breath of the Wild. Ultra Hand is just an upgraded version of it, but it does the exact same things. In fact, I really can't imagine them going back after this to a game which doesn't have some kind of manipulation of this style. Just like cooking and power gliding, Building things feels to me not just a unique one-off gimmick for this game, but such a core principle of the game, something that makes you feel so empowered and free that removing it would feel quite difficult. I don't know whether it would be a core ability again or whether they might find another way to integrate it, perhaps by acquiring specific tools like hammers or welding torches that might allow you to manipulate different objects progressively as you explore the world and gather more powerful tools, but somehow or other, I would be astonished if they backtrack on having the world of Zelda be manipulable to this degree. It's one of the things that really set Zelda apart as an open-air game compared to other titles. In a lot of games they are fundamentally walking simulators, but in Zelda everything can be interacted with and manipulated to a degree that other games can only begin to imagine. Indeed, if Nintendo ever does decide to go down a virtual reality route, one big possibility is the chance to return to hand controls. Manipulating Ultra Hand is fine, but can be a little fiddly, especially at first. But if swinging your Wiimote to Link's sword was fun, imagine being able to use your hands to move and build things in a 3D space. So let's compare the second powers from Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, Stasis and Recall. Again, these two powers have similar functions. They control time. Now, I'm not sure time control is quite as essential to the new Zelda formula as the other powers were, but it's clearly an interest of Fujibayashi's, and it's certainly having many interesting applications. I also have to notice that Stasis is effectively still in the game again. It doesn't function in quite the same way in Tears of the Kingdom, of course, but Recall effectively allows you to pause items as well as to rewind them. Yet again, with Fujibayashi, nothing is wasted. Okay, you may argue, but Cryonis isn't in Tears of the Kingdom. Isn't it, though? Sure, you can't make ice blocks or mortar in quite the same way, although you can freeze smaller patches, but the functionality of Cryonis was essentially a power of traversal. It allowed you to cross areas that were otherwise tricky to cross, and so open the world up to players. But with Ultra Hand, that ability is no longer necessary. You can just grab bits of wood and position them into the body of water and jump across. Indeed, Tears of the Kingdom gives you another traversal ability, Ascend. I absolutely love using Ascend, and what's interesting is that it was Fujibashi's suggestion himself, after he discovered that it was so much more fun using it when debugging the game. Although on the surface, Cryonis and Ascend may seem radically different, they are both powers that aid traversal, and I think that the next game will only continue down the path of having one of the powers focus primarily on traversal. I don't know if Ascend itself will return, but I would be astonished if future games don't incorporate some way to achieve similar results, especially if they maintain that level of verticality. Climbing is fun for limited time, but actually being able to zoop up makes a big difference when you're doing a lot of vertical travelling. The fourth power is also very different between the games, and yet occupies the same role. Bombs and Fuse are both primarily systems designed to aid combat and bombs are still there as Zonai devices. Sure, you might need to do some creative thinking to find the equivalent of a square bomb, but Ultra Hand is powerful enough to get you by by fusing it to boxes or whatever else. I like that they didn't go straight down the rabbit hole of creating some kind of elaborate crafting system, but I also think the capacity is there to develop, evolve, and build weapons, and that's gonna become another core part of Zelda games for a long time to come even if Fuse itself ceases to be one of Link's fundamental powers. 
So our new blueprint for a Zelda game has four key powers introduced at the beginning of the game, and each of those four has a very specific role. One for manipulating the environment. One for manipulating time. One allowing for traversal, and one to aid with combat. I would be frankly astonished if the next game did not replicate this exact formula and iterate on these four powers. The approach may change, just as bombs in Tears of the Kingdom are treated very differently from bombs in Breath of the Wild, but the substance will remain. More than that, I fully expect all four powers from Tears of the Kingdom to remain in the game, at least in some form. Recall is the one that could go easiest, as it seems to be a function more of Fujibashi's personal interests rather than an essential part of the gameplay formula. But since Fujibashi seems to be directing future games, at least from the way he's talking in interviews about having an idea for the next one that he's yet to share with Eiji Onuma, I would expect some kind of similar time mechanic to be implemented somehow. Whether it's making time shift stones, a Zonine device you can attach to arrows, or whatever else, it seems incomprehensible to me that Ultra Hand and Fuse don't become, in their own way, staples of the Zelda franchise. And while I doubt Ascend will continue to exist in its exact form, I think the player would feel depowered by its absence, and if there's one thing that the Zelda team love to do, it's to give the players a sense of incredible power. Maybe it's not quite the same as withholding the Paraglider in the early places of Tears of the Kingdom in terms of feeling depowered, but it's not far off if you don't have the ability to ascend quickly. Even the Master Cycle Zero essentially came back, albeit as a build-it-yourself vehicle set. Yet again, it seems to me that what we're talking about isn't turning over the gameplay board and laying out the pieces afresh between games. These changes that they're making, they're too big, the mechanics too laboured over, their reception too rapturous to imagine that we can ever turn back the clock again. Skyward Sword walked so Breath of the Wild could run, and Breath of the Wild ran so Tears of the Kingdom could soar, but I don't think Fujibashi is done iterating and building on what is achieved. I would point to some more, perhaps slightly more obscure examples of him taking what he's done before and perfecting it. The Picori of Minish Cap were proposed for Breath of the Wild. It didn't happen, but I imagine it's an idea that he has on the table and would like to see there one day. Fujibashi's beloved Gust Bellows from Minish Cap have reappeared in different forms with the fan and any number of wind-based shrines. And if you look back to the Oracles game, one emphasises combat, while one emphasises puzzle solving, an idea actually originated by Miyamoto, but separating out the two main drivers of the Zelda game into different sections is something he already pioneered. Now, look at the depths and look at the sky and tell me what you notice. The depths are primarily focused on survival and combat skills with terrifying enemies and powerful gloom. The sky is mostly focused on puzzles and generally is a little more peaceful. Not to say there aren't overworld bosses in the sky or that there aren't puzzles underground, but the slant is towards one or the other. Even the flux constructs are slightly more puzzle focused as fights than some, and the lack of corks or shrine puzzles in the depths reduces the intensity of puzzle action when down there. You see, what I'm getting at is that Hidemaru Fujibashi is carrying the best ideas with him and building on top of them in a way that hasn't been Nintendo's custom before. Yes, they've had amazing ideas, but those ideas have been limited to one game only. Then they've kept maybe a few smaller elements, but fundamentally they've got in a new direction each time. And while it's tempting to think, oh, that's just because Tears of the Kingdom is a sequel, I go back to which element that he has introduced would you actually want to lose? Or more to the point, what elements wouldn't you be disappointed to see retired? This isn't to say there won't be new mechanics in future games, and Fujibashi has already said as much. In fact, it's essential that they create a new fundamental core mechanic that is going to drive a new Zelda experience. But there's a strong chance that they won't replace previous mechanics, but will build on top of them rather than starting from scratch. Which prompts the next question. If so much has remained in the same, what else remains the same? I mean, we're used to thinking about what will be different to future Zelda games, but I really think a lot of these mechanics and structures will be carried along, so which ones will also stay? When you look at the key parts that may seem repetitive from Breath of the Wild, they all have really important functions. Weapon breaking encourages you to engage enemies. The shrines provide fast travel points and break up fighting with regular puzzle opportunities. I know there's a large group of people who dislike shrines, but I think this is a misplaced frustration from the lack of fuller dungeons. The shrines themselves are a terrific idea, it seems to me, and perfect for pick up and play, portable play, which suits the Switch. I assume the find five keys to the dungeon format of the Divine Beast and Tears of the Kingdom temples were influenced by the idea that even the dungeon should be traversable in any order. 
it seems to me that there is still scope to try to figure out a way to create a more complex dungeon that nevertheless allows elements of choice within it. So that's something we could look at in a future video. Koroks might also go in the next game, but you need something to fill that role of adding disposable puzzles as poor Addison can't be holding up President Hudson every five steps. It doesn't have to be the Koroks, but given their tiny size and playful manner, it's tricky to think of a better fit. Memories scattered across the landscape play a big part in both games, and I expect a similar mechanic in the next game too, if only because it links the emotional narrative to the exploration in a fascinating way. It would be easy otherwise for these games just to become sandbox romps, and often they are, but the more these locations are in view with history and pathos, the richer the story becomes. Similarly, I cannot imagine how they would change having shrines as fast travel points and bite-sized puzzle stops across the world, and so many of the systems in the games are reliant on weapon breaking, cooking, and the weather mechanics. This isn't to say the development team can copy and paste huge chunks of code wholesale from Tears of the Kingdom, but I don't think they're planning to start from a blank page either. Let's take it further and look at enemies. The enemy roster in Breath of the Wild was one of its weaker points. There are so many different enemies and really fascinating, strange, creepy, bizarre creatures in Tears of the Kingdom. It's one of the great strengths of the game. But apart from the Guardians, most of the Breath of the Wild enemies made the return. And in fact, most of the enemies that are there are basically reconstituted from previous iterations of Zelda games anyway. Octoroks and Moblins. So why dump them? Why not take those key enemies, build on them? develop them, add more and more and more, so that the next game has an even more vast array of foes. The goblins are fantastic, their animations are engaging. You might change the graphical style slightly, but I don't see a reason to change the core of the enemies. Also, some kind of blood moon mechanic, where the enemies revive every seven days, seems to be essential. They might not call it a blood moon, and frankly I find the blood moon a little bit annoying, but the concept of it is going to need to be in place. Now what I'm describing here, with so many things staying the same, might sound alarming to some people who are used to Zelda ripping up the rulebook every time. We've had one game that leaned heavily on its predecessor and it sounds like I'm saying the team is going to continue to tinker rather than revolutionise, but look at Tears of the Kingdom. The introduction of particularly the Ultra Hand mechanics were not tinkering, but utterly revolutionary, and it's this desire to find new gameplay techniques that open up the world which I think Fujibayashi finds crucial. This is what he means by multiplicative gameplay. Yes, you have brand new features, but also you have something there already, which you can then multiply. You can't multiply if you don't already have a really solid foundation in place. And yes, there are multiplicative elements to Nintendo's history, but it's not generally the way that Nintendo has worked before. Fujibayashi though wants to take what's there and expand it by multiplying out the possibilities. Removing vehicles, removing the sky, removing traversal or combat mechanics, removing the enemy variety, none of this is going to move the series forward in a multiplicative way. He is going to be looking for mechanics that open up possibilities for the player that are brand new, and to do this, I believe he's going to build on what we already have. And of course, one key thing he's going to build from is the physics engine. The changes to that are cumulative, and the more things work together, the more possibilities emerge. Now look, at the end of the day, the precise extent to which Fujibashi will innovate as opposed to building on what he's gone before is hard to say precisely, but I do think the next game will be closer to the previous games than would even be considered possible a decade ago. Fujibashi is developing mechanics and ideas that are both his passions and are also popular and successful, making their return not just likely, but perhaps fairly inevitable. So, how does Hidemaru Fujibashi square the circle? What new powers could future games introduce to aid item manipulation, time control, traversal and combat? And what new multiplicative gameplay experience could he have up his sleeve for the next Zelda title? Yeah. In, the in the meantime, please hit the subscribe button to see more Nintendo forecasts and say hello in the comments if you have your own thoughts on what we've been discussing. Thank you so much for watching this video. Take care and see you soon.